I'm Jody Burnett. And I'm Jennifer Southall. And we're priests and pastors at St. Peter's Episcopal Church in Oxford, Mississippi. Our goal with this podcast is to lift up voices from within our community and from around the wider church and to feature stories of joy, hope, and encouragement for your journey of faith. We are delighted to welcome you to On This Rock for the building up of the church. We pray this episode will be a blessing to our listeners. Welcome back to On This Rock. We're delighted to have uh, with us as our guest today, Liam Neiman. Uh, This is our penultimate episode of season one. Jennifer used that word in a meeting the other day, penultimate. Nobody knew what it meant. It means the near final, uh, the next to last episode of season one. We'll do this one and one more, and then we'll take a break for the summer. But uh, Liam, it's a delight to have you today. Uh, Liam was with us as an undergraduate at the University of Mississippi for several years. He graduated last spring uh, from the Center for the Study of Southern Culture uh, and is now in New Haven, Connecticut. He's spending a year at the St. Hilda's House, living in intentional community uh, as part of the Episcopal Service Corps. Uh, This is a community, uh, a cohort that's devoted to prayer, study, service, discernment, uh, and intentionality. Uh, Covenant community, of course, is so uh, much a part at the very heart of what we are called to do, who we're called to be as Christians, as people of faith, uh, and living with community norms is such an important piece of uh, our life, our our responsibility, our obligation to each other. So um, we thought who better to welcome as our guest as we uh, delve into the topic of community uh, in this sixth episode. So Liam, Welcome. I'd love for you to just start off by introducing yourself. Uh, Tell us a little bit about your background, uh, how you landed in this really awesome year-long program, uh, sort of what experiences led you to consider that as a a meaningful opportunity for this year uh, post-graduation, and anything else uh, sort of on the autobiographical front that you want to share, we would love to hear. Yeah, thank you so much for, uh, for introducing me and having me on the podcast, Judy. Yeah, I am originally from um, a small town in Pennsylvania. I grew up there and then came to uh, the University of Mississippi when I was um, after I graduated high school um, and studied there for four years, uh, studied English and Southern Studies. Um, It kind of just happened. uh, It felt very naturally that I got in very interested in Southern culture and Southern history. And um, for a long time, during my college years, I had, ex- I had expected that I would go on to grad school in, um, you know, history or American studies or something like that. And, you know, as I got closer and closer to the end of my, um, or not necessarily the end, but where I had to decide what to do about next year, um, as I was a senior, I, I don't know, I started to have some, some doubts about the, like, whether what I was thinking of doing was actually what I was intended to do um, and what impact it would have. And, um, you know, I think that there's, there's certainly, uh, you know, as I saw when I was in college, there's certainly um, ways that, you know, being in academia can be useful to other people outside of just the academy. But I just felt like my heart was not doing that. And I felt like I needed to do something else. Um, and that's what drew me to apply to the, the Episcopal Service Corps. I had applied the way it's set up. You apply to like five different um, locations. And I had interviews with all these places. And I was kind of choosing between New York and um, New Haven. And what I really liked at first about um, uh, the program in New Haven at St. Hilda's House was was that, like you had mentioned, that intentionality and that focus on prayer. Um, I think, you know, all the sites have different characters, personalities, and I think St. Hilda's is definitely, um, you know, really focused on spirituality and integrating us into the life of the church as much as that's possible, um, which has been a little bit hampered by COVID. Um, And so I, you know, I had kind of chosen um, that if I was going to do the ESC that I would go to St. Hilda's house and then kind of got down to this, this time in quarantine in like the very beginning of, of um, 
COVID in the U.S. in like March and April. And I just had all this like time on my hands, um, nothing much else to do besides finish out my classwork and think about what to do next year. And it was at that time that I felt like I finally, once I had the time to like sit down and think about it and rest a little bit is when I really decided and, um, you know, turned to prayer to figure out that I think for this year I was called to to come to St. Hilda's house. So, um, you yeah, know, then I committed to it and uh, started here in August of uh, 2020. Prayer and contemplation, Liam, as you've learned, can be incredibly clarifying. And I want to come back to that. But I think also experiences can be revelatory and clarifying. And so I want to sort of lift up something and ask a question of you. I know that you focused in your studies on the history of incarceration. And you also, uh, a couple of years ago, went, uh, for those who don't know, we make an annual pilgrimage, St. Peter's does, we take a group over to Parchman, uh, to the prison for a uh, service of Advent lessons and carols. We sing songs, we read scripture, there's a short homily, there's a time of worship and fellowship, and then we, uh, we share some simple gifts with uh, the men who are there. Uh, and we send a group every year, and you went with a few college students with our chaplain at the time, the Reverend Kirk Lafon, and I remember you telling me that that was uh, a moment when you realized uh, that, that your life was opening up in sort of an interesting uh, and spirit-driven way. So I wonder if you can just talk a little bit about that and how that might have been a catalyst for your wanting to go and spend a year in intentional community. Yeah, so um, during the, you know, the Advent season of my senior year, I had the chance to go to Parchman and um you know, for anyone who, who's not been on this trip, you know, I would definitely recommend that uh, when it starts back up again, that you go just um, just at the very least so that you can kind of um, have the chance to witness what this um, institution is like and what, because it, it's, I think it's purposefully made so that we as, um, you know, people in the free world don't witness um, and bear witness to what is, what is going on there. Um, but yeah, so uh, went on this trip had, um, you know, throughout my, the fall of my um, senior year, had, you know, taken a couple classes that were um, about the history and culture um, surrounding, like, mass incarceration in the U.S., and um, I think what happened were, there, there was a bunch of things that happened in this experience, but one was that all of that, like, academic book knowledge that I gained was, like, tested up against reality. So I guess, um, you know, just uh, to give a little description of what it was like. So, um, you know, it, uh, Parchman is a former plant. It's a it still is like a plantation prison. And there is but n most of the grounds now are not in use. So it's, you know, just this one building um, that houses most of the, um, you know, all uh, the men, men who are in prison there. And, you know, it took us like from to get in to this, to the place where we would be, um, you know, worshiping. It took us like, I don't know, it felt like like 20 whole minutes of driving just from the entrance to this place. So it's this huge complex um, that's just, uh, you know, I guess created so that they could, uh, you know, use these fields for labor. And then also so that you could have, um, you know, if someone was trying to run away, you would just have tons of uh, vision to see them. And, you know, again, we get, uh, you know, there's a couple of check stops on the way and then, um, or checkpoints. And then, you know, we get inside the uh, gates and I mean, you could just kind of immediately see it. This was a place that was, um, you know, like, I think Mississippi is one of the most incarcerated um, states in the most incarcerated country in the world. But, it's also still like so underfunded that it's not even like, um, you know, it's like particularly uh, bad conditions. And, you know, there was, um, you know, holes in the wall where animals were nesting. Um, and all these things are just kind of like coming at me because, uh, you know, it's, it's such a far cry from, you know, the, the kind of places that I've been living in and, um, doing my work at for the last four years and like 
talking about some things related to some of the things I was seeing, but just not um, witnessing. And so we get inside the, the unit, and um, I think what really struck me was that there was um, the way that the building is set up is it's um, like a it's not like individual cells like you might imagine a prison being like it's all these um, bunks around like an outer wall. Um, and the men were, I think, instructed to stay at the bunks and we were kind of in the middle and we could move about. But I think that they were not allowed to. And. But it was like this open space because there was no walls between us. But I think what really like shook me in this experience was the fact that there were no physical walls, but I could still feel this sense um, of this distance between us. And it was, um, you know, it's, it's, I think that it's, um, you know, a lot of it is uh, human, you know, is, is a work of, of human sin and like all the different systems and, um, you know, uh, overlapping oppressions that separate me from them. But also, um, you know, I think that as I look back now, I can kind of see that there was this sense of like, spiritual evil that can't necessarily be explained just by, um, you know, human sinfulness and distance between people. Um, and I guess what, what's changed in my perception of this, um, this, uh, uh, like event or, um, this day was, you know, when I was there, as I was kind of, kind of experiencing it firsthand, um, you know, worshiping together, singing these songs, um, doing like, you know, going through the readings and this liturgy that I was familiar with was in the, in the moment, it felt kind of, um, you know, hollow or something. It felt like, you know, you know, we're supposed to be in community with these people. Um, but it, it still feels, it's, it feels so weird because of all this distance that's between us, even though we're, you know, I'm, I'm shaking people's hands. Um, but I think what, what has changed for me as I've thought about it is that um, all of this was, it had nothing to do with any deficiency on God's part um, or in the gospel. And, you know, the good news, it was that these, these were limitations on my own heart and on the heart of the people that were with me in the room, because, you know, we are just, um, you know, people, there, there is no help in us. So, um, you know, as I was uh, experiencing this and l- looking back on it, it's that, you know, the, um, and that I think that I really, my, by being so like brought down in a sense and my faith being challenged in that moment, it's brought me, it's come back stronger because I realized that, um, no, it was actually, I was underestimating the, you know, uh, inestimable power of, of the gospel more so than I was, um, more so than it had anything to do with any limitations that are on that. So, um, you know, I think that anyway, after the experience, it kind of, um, you know, I had to like sort through all these things and it was around the time as I was considering applying to ESC and, um, you know, it just, it, the whole experience really, um, it, it challenged me and I think it made me think more seriously in a new way about, um, about my plans for the next year. That's really fascinating, Liam, to hear you talk about that. And I think I, I want to pick up on something that you said, because I think that what I'm hearing certainly is that, you know, there was a sense of evil, uh, not in those, uh, not from whatever those people who were incarcerated had done, but in that separation, which, you know, makes me think of the really insidious nature of sin, that it's not, you know, the other uh, that is evil or sinful, but it's our perception that separates us and that that separation. Um, mm-hmm. That, and I was thinking too, that, you know, that was a particular uh, type of community uh, that led you to the community uh, where you are now. And I just sort of wonder, um, what is your uh you have sort of a rhythm and a rule of life um uh in in some ways as as those men who are incarcerated at at parchment have what is your day-to-day like in community sure yeah so um you know 
the uh, the day to day uh, experience at, at St. Hilda's house is, um, you know, throughout the week, we all, you know, wake up, um, we uh, try our best to get to what is now all on um, Zoom morning prayer um, at 8 a.m. And that that has really been a um, very grounding experience. And just um, like by doing the daily office like that so regularly and so routinely, um, it's just really kind of opened that up for me in a new way. Um, and, you know, then then we're all off to our various service sites. And, you know, some people this year are working from home as well. Um, but, you know, there's um, six of us who live in the house, including myself, and we all have um, placements at different locations and doing different things. And, you know, then in the evenings, we four days a week, we have a community meal together that someone prepares and, you know, the other people help set up the table and um, clean afterwards. And um, we also have a house meeting and um, uh, formation on Fridays, which involves, you know, um, a study of like theology or discussions about discernment, then um, uh, a, a conversational Spanish class and um, a Bible study that has had a uh, different, um, you know, we've gone through different texts. And, and then on Sundays, we worship together um, in the morning. And actually, just starting this week, we'll be able to um, help in person with Christ Church, uh, Christ Church's Compline service, which is like a big, um, a big service for them that's, you know, it's in the darkness of the church with uh, only lit by candles and um, chanted on, on Sundays at 9pm as the, you know, as the, um, the end of the week. So we're, we're really excited to get started with that. Um, and yeah, like with the rule of life, we, at the beginning of the year, we had a, a retreat where we had time to kind of think through all these things and lay them all out. And, um, you know, we have a lot of the, the, a lot of the rule of life is very routine things like, you know, the rota for who does the dishes and who is, um, you know, cleaning up after the meals and things like that. And then other parts that are more, um, you know, kind of values based, like what, you know, uh, if we have, a, if there's a conflict, what kind of attitude should we have towards the other people? Um, and, you know, um, just the general structure of our prayer life. And a lot of those things seem, you know, pretty mundane or pract like just like very much like practicalities. But I think like having them set out just gives you so much more um, freedom because you don't have to you know, things will arise, but you don't have to like um, think through or worry about them like you do in other communities where there's not those um, those those rules that are already created and thought about. We read through in preparation for this conversation. We read through some scripture passages that were related directly to the concept of community. And Jennifer and I observed that really the entirety of scripture is all about community. So it was sort of hard to narrow in on a few, but. We looked at uh, Paul's letter to the Romans. We looked at First Thessalonians. We looked at First Peter. And uh, what struck me was that, you know, in, in all of these writings, there are very clear and direct exhortations towards uh, uh, communal living and the obligations of the, the mutual responsibilities of communal living. And you've alluded to this sort of indirectly, Liam, that there is on the one hand this uh, this this joy, this constant sort of encouragement, this uh, this fellowship that comes as a gift from community life. But there's also, I think, on the other side of things, a challenge. You mentioned a couple of times, you know, having doubts, having uncertainty, wanting to test an idea, uh, being accountable to each other. And, and with that, I think, comes, and you've, again, mentioned it, a certain level of, of tension that's inevitable. So I wonder if you might just talk about now towards the end of your year, you've got what I think another month and a half left at St. Hilda's. So what have been sort of the unique joys of community life and what have been kind of the unique challenges of community life there in New Haven? Um, I think that some of the joys have certainly been the, I think just the, the having the space uh, to think about things and, um, you know, to, uh, you know, be in this routine of prayer, which is something that is, I think the, the further you get from a community like this, 
the more difficult that it can kind of become to maintain. You know, it's not impossible. And I think that the things that I'm learning this year will certainly help me as I go out um, on my own. But, um, you know, and I, I, but I think that, that that's definitely one of the joys. Um, and also just, I, I get a lot of joy out of, um, you know, I love to cook and like preparing meals for other people or just like having, um, having the chance to do stuff like that has been um, a source of, of a lot of joy. Um, and the, the, cha- the main challenges that I've faced, I think, were, I guess, one of the challenges was at the beginning, which was that I am, uh, you know, I'm, you know, I, like I said, I like to, I like to cook. I'm pretty, um, you know, kind of like uh, particular about a lot of this stuff, um, you know, like keeping the house clean and, and things like this. And I think like that was challenging at the beginning because I felt an obligation to do it, even if it wasn't my like job or it wasn't necessarily something that needed to be done, um, you know, to the, to the extent that I would, if, if it was like all in my control. So I think learning how to like cede some of that control to other people and just kind of being like, um, learning tolerance and patience. Um, I think we're, we're really, uh, kind of difficult at first, but, um, you know, enjoyable. And I think, um, and also learning how to, uh, like delegate tasks and things like that. Um, and, and just communicate through things because, um, yeah, that was, that was challenging at first. Um, I think also this year in particular with how much time we've spent, um, you know, just sort of in the house and not getting to go out and do the things that I think would normally have been done. It's been challenging to, yeah, just, just handle all that free time that inside the house and not, um, you know, finding ways to keep life at least mildly engaging, I guess. Um, and also feel connected to like the parish because that's, that's been really challenging. Um, this year has been, you know, we're this little intentional community that's part of this larger, um, you know, Christ church parish. And how do we fit in there when we can't necessarily, you know, go to potlucks or, you know, worship, um, indoors without masks on and ling- linger at coffee hour and things like that. So that's been, that's been a really challenging part to, uh, challenging part of the year as well. But I think, um, that we've, we've, you know, we've, we've kind of figured out some ways to do that. And, um, it also, I think will make me appreciate that kind of community a lot more um, once we can kind of get back to it. Liam, I'm, I'm interested if, in whether there's anything that has surprised you about living in community, about uh, yourself in community. I think that what has been surprising um, has been um, two things. So uh, one was, like I said, that, that sense of like patience and tolerance that I've kind of um, developed, which I, I guess is one of the fruits of the spirit. So, um, but like that, I think that in previous uh, living situations, sometimes when you don't have that rule of life that's set up, you know, if someone doesn't do the dishes, it's easy to, um, you know, to, to lash out or to like have it be this big thing. Whereas I've kind of, when you know that eventually it will get done, or can be corrected because there's like a, um, you know, agreed upon, um, you know, like covenant, then I think that that's like, it surprised me that it's um, how well that has seemed to work in the overall, even if it doesn't necessarily feel like that moment from moment to moment. I think also I was surprised, um, like at, at the very beginning of the year, um, like, how much, uh, you know, you make snap judgments about people and I'm sure that other people made snap judgments about me and just like how wrong that those can be or, um, you know, how, and, and I think like both how wrong they can be, but then by spending the time and living with those people and getting to know them and sharing of yourself and learning from them, like um, how much you can grow past those initial um, kind of misjudgments. And um, so, yeah, I think that that's, that, you know, that's a good, uh, good proof that, that, that those are, are oftentimes wrong. 
you talked about learning patience and compromising when it comes to tasks and also when it comes to getting to know people. But I think an experience I've had in community, which has surprised me, is that we also come into covenant relationships with uh, certain ideas, very strong ideas, often about, you know, what's right and the best way to, to proceed and the best way to, to problem solve and so on and so forth. And, and St. Paul talks a lot about humility, uh, about um, being right sized, recognizing our gifts and recognizing how those gifts fit into the overall health and movement of the uh, entire body. So I know, especially when I was in seminary, Jennifer, I think this was true for you too, but in church leadership, uh, in my family system, even in my close friend groups, uh, you know, I've had to sort of learn how to compromise when it comes to ideas and when it comes to learning what other people think, how other people see things. And I wonder, has that been a similar experience for you there at St. Hilda's? Yeah, there there has been um, definitely been some of that because I think that uh, you know, especially when you know we're having the, the, the formation discussions about theology or about um, you know uh, you know kind of like social issues or things like that, there can definitely be some some conflicts like that that arise. Um, and to be honest with you, I think like I have. I think that I've I've I think that I've learned that humility a bit through learning that I just don't know a lot um, in the grand scheme of things. Like um, I think that like especially in in the, the areas of like um, you know the of, of things that we're discussing like about theology or church history and things like that. You know I just um, compared to some some of the people that I'm you know learning from that I live with. I just don't, I don't know much. And I, I've kind of learned to, uh, you know, kind of, um, you know, just hold my tongue if I don't know what I'm talking about. Um, so I think that, yeah, that's, um, that certainly does come up. I, we haven't had any huge, um, ideological spats, but, um, it definitely does, does come up a little bit. I think the other thing, just to sort of carry this one step forward and not, and we may be uh, running out of time, but the other important piece about community particularly Christian community, covenant community, is that when things get tough, when we disagree, the call to stay in relationship and not break away, the call to stay in conversation and not to, to, to deflect, but to, to really commit to each other to dig in. I think that is such a unique and wonderful thing that can be challenging, but that is also a gift. Uh, and I know that you've, you've received that gift, I'm sure, many times over this year. I want to just also lift up Liam, we've talked about, and I've talked with a few other people about the idea, and this is a dream, but I think it's a dream that can one day become a reality uh, of, of converting the Van Buren house, which we own, it's right across the street from the church, into a, uh, into a residential community, um, much like the one that you're a part of right now, whereby people commit to a certain covenant of life that involves uh, this sort of mutual encouragement, humility, prayer, service, hospitality, um, service in the community, participation in the life of the church. Uh, I think there's such a, a, an incredible possibility. And OU, I know, does something like that. And, and maybe we're copying them a little bit, but uh, all of the best artists beg, borrow, and steal. So there's no shame in that. But I want to just say that out loud because I think it's something that we will begin talking more seriously about, especially, Liam, when you come back to Oxford which will happen at the end of the summer, and you've had this experience, which is a gift you can share with us. Uh, but it's sort of to that end, what are you, as you round out your time at St. Hilda's, and as you look towards coming back to St. Peter's and Oxford, uh, in the vein of community, uh, and in the vein of, of this ongoing work that, that you're doing, what are you most excited about? What are you most uh, looking forward to? Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about, um... I think like with all, uh, with, with everyone in the house, you know, we had spent a lot of time thinking about, you know, what will, what will we be doing next year and kind of having that ironed out gives me a lot of room to breathe. Um, so I think I'm excited to just, you know, enjoy, enjoy community, enjoy, um, New Haven in, in the, in the nice spring weather and in all of that, just, um, you know, a little bit unencumbered. Yeah. And I'm also really excited that we're going to get to get back more in-person worship. You know, we've been doing outdoor mass um 
in the Christchurch garden for the entirety of the year, but, um, you know, to be able to, to help out with, um, with Compline a little bit and to, um, you know, to be able to worship in the beauty of the church for the last month of our, of our time there, I think will be, um, really great. Um, and then actually I have, um, uh, one of the things that I've gotten involved with kind of during my time at, at um, St. Hilda's in my free time has been um, helping out at the local Catholic worker house. And I've learned a lot about, um, you know, really direct service and community from, from them and from Mark and Luz, the two people that, that run the Catholic worker house here. And um, I'm at the end of June, I'm spending a week um, at a Catholic worker farm in um, upstate New York. I'm really excited to, to get to, to do that and to have some, you know, I think some time for like, uh, rest, restful labor, maybe. I, I think it'll be a lot of work, but I think it'll be, um, a respite from what I've been doing for the past year and just, um, you know, the chance to take some time in nature and, and think about all that. Liam, I'm just reminded, um, you know, how important, uh, prayer and particularly contemplation is and, and how that sort of turning inward um, and looking at our own sinfulness uh, and, the, and the grace that's been given to us and examining that uh, sort of softens our hearts and, and, and makes uh, being able to live with five other people in a house um, possible. And uh, I, you just seem to uh, exhibit that very well. I'm very thankful for uh, your presence. At St. Peter's for the time that you were here and, and that you're coming back to Oxford. And I wonder if you might just uh, say a word about uh, how the effects of prayer have, uh, or how prayer has affected you uh, during your time in that house. No, uh, like I said, we have um, routine morning prayer and, you know, um, having the chance to do that uh, every day and to know that there's a space where we will, um, you know, go through all the ways that we should um, show our thanks and offer up intercessions and, um, you know, reflect on the, the word revealed to us by God. I think just knowing that, that we have the space to do that has um, really integrated it into my life in a way that it wasn't. Um, you know, I think sometimes when you know, you're just going to, when you're going to church on Sundays, but you're not uh, necessarily praying the daily office every day or, you know, some other form of spiritual practice, it can kind of feel like this, um, you know, kind of like false dichotomy of the, you know, church and spiritual and religious life and your regular life. But I think um, like doing that every morning before I go and do all my, all the other things I need to do um, has really kept me in that mode um, in that prayerful and faithful mode of, of being. Um, and I think it's also having that has made me more conscious of, you know, the needs of others. I think I am like, you know, I'm, I'm trying to, trying to be steadfast in prayer for, for other people as well as myself. Um, and so just, um, you know, like when you're turning to God daily in, um, praying for yourself and for others versus, you know, just doing that when it, when it feels like you're at the absolute, um, you know, uh, edge and can't, can't do anything else. Like, um, you know, I think that that's, uh, that that really has an effect on just on your general being. Um, that's been something that I've learned and have really appreciated. Liam, it's been so good to see you and talk to you, and it's been a, a pleasure to have you as our guest. And I will just say, as we close, this this rhythm of life, this habit of life that you've described and that you've given us a glimpse of, uh, it is not just uh, designed for people living in intentional community or monastic community or religious community. It's not just for people in uh, times of transition, as you are, between graduation and discerning your uh, vocational path forward, uh, what, what you'll do professionally in your life. It's, it's for all of us uh, and, and for all times. And so the rhythm of, of prayer, study, service, uh, accountability, the habits of, of uh, humility, love, devotion, these are things that we could all do well to, to, to work better at. Uh, so 
all that's to say, Liam, when you come back to Oxford and when we reintroduce you to St. Peter's, I hope folks will seek you out and, you know, try to get a better sense of what your uh, what your year has been like and, and how they might glean uh, some some new spiritual disciplines and, and subsequent joys from their conversations with you. So, again, part of the point of this podcast is to lift up voices of the faithful, and I hope we've done that this episode. Uh, Liam, blessings to you as you round out your time at St. Hilda's. We look forward to having you back. Uh, Jennifer, it's always fun to do this, and we'll be back for the ultimate, uh, the final episode in two weeks, and then we'll break for the summer. Liam, thank you again. Yeah, thank you for having me, and I um, definitely would appreciate prayers as I get ready to come back to St. Peter's, and we'll, we'll be keeping you all in my prayers as well. Absolutely. Thank you, Liam. We hope you've enjoyed this episode. Leave us a comment, drop us a line, subscribe, and share with your friends. If there are topics or guests you'd like us to consider, please let us know. Thank you for tuning in to On This Rock for the building up of the church.